From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew. Funding for Ukraine and Israel set to pass the House as Democrats line up behind Speaker Mike Johnson's plan and some conservative Republicans oppose it. We'll explore the path forward with Congressman Mike Turner of Ohio, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee. And we'll look at how the money would be used by Ukraine and Israel with Evelyn Farkas, executive director of the McCain Institute at Arizona State University. Plus, all 12 jurors now selected in Donald Trump's trial in New York as Joe Biden campaigns in Pennsylvania. We'll have the latest from the campaign trail. So certainly, Joe, while both the presumptive Democrat and Republican nominee are elsewhere, there's plenty happening here in Washington, including forward progress on these three different aid packages. It's been a busy day on Capitol Hill. We still have a lot of questions, Kaylee, about the form that this is going to take, about whether there's going to be a rule that allows this to follow regular order or if this might take a different path in the next couple of days. We are gearing up, though, for voting as early as Saturday. Speaker Mike Johnson spoke about his belief that aid to our allies is crucial. Let's listen. This is a critical time right now, a critical time on the world stage. I, I could make a... You know, I, I can make a selfish decision and, and, and do something that, um, th th that's different, but I, I'm doing here what I believe to be the right thing. Um, I think pr providing lethal aid to Ukraine right now is critically important. I really do. I really do believe the intel and, and the briefings that we've gotten that, G that, um, that I, I believe Xi and, and, and Vladimir Putin and, and Iran really are an axis of evil. I think they're in coordination on this. Joining us now is Congressman Mike Turner of Ohio, chair of the House Select Committee on Intelligence, who has been pushing for these votes for some time now. Mr. Chairman, welcome to Bloomberg. We're glad to have you here. I wonder your thoughts on what we just heard from the Speaker of the House. I really do believe the intel and the briefings that we've gotten. And it comes just hours after your committee, yourself and the ranking member of the Intelligence Com Committee, issued a statement that made clear that Ukraine funding needed to pass this week. Can you speak to the urgency as to why this week and what you told Speaker Johnson to bring him to this point? Yeah, well, the, the intelligence is very clear. Uh, Ukraine is at a critical point, as the Speaker just said. Uh, they are running out of ammunition. Uh, Russia is uh, certainly uh, surging and putting additional pressure on that front line. Uh, and also the lack of U.S. support is impacting morale even on, in Ukraine. But their ability to be able to sustain the fight, and, and they are fighting uh, honorably uh, to keep Russia from taking additional ground in Ukraine, uh, is, is essential. Uh, also, we have the issue of you know, that uh, you know, in this package, I think this will result in the administration uh, giving additional weapons capabilities to Ukraine so we can change the, the, uh, the uh, dynamics on the battlefield. They need longer range weapons and they need to be able to hit Crimea. They need to be able to hit the supply lines of Russia as they're coming into uh, Ukraine as part of this aggression. And I think this package is, mm -hmm. is desperately needed to turn this, uh, the tide on this uh, conflict and support Ukraine. But, sir, how quickly can it do so? You speak of changing the dynamics on the ground. How quickly can this make a difference in a fight that Ukraine is already engaged in, knowing there may be a lag for them to receive some of this? Right. So, you know, I've, I've asked this question both to our Department of Defense. We had the U.S. ambassador of uh, from Ukraine, uh, the, the U.S. ambassador to Ukraine that was here uh, with us today, all of them report uh, that we are poised to, be able to get this aid to them immediately. So if um, this package passes, and I think it will overwhelmingly this Saturday, uh, the, uh, the United States is poised to make certain uh, that the ammunition is in the hands of the Ukrainians and that they're able to take it directly to the fight with Russia. There's been a call for border uh, funding as well. Of course, this was a big debate leading into the, the Senate uh, bill that passed. I know border aid was a question in the Senate, Congressman. And with, there was a, an attempt to get some uh, border legislation cleared through rules last evening. It didn't work out. Congressman Chip Roy, your uh, colleague from Texas, issued a statement saying, sorry, not sorry, for opposing a crappy rule that is a show vote, a cover vote for funding Ukraine instead of border security. The refrain we've been hearing from the Republican conferences, 
protect our own border before we do so our allies. Will there be a border peace that comes along with this legislation this weekend? The House has already passed H.R. 2 that would effectively complete uh, the border wall and close the border and at the same time um, hold accountable uh, the administration for what they've they've created in this open border situation where over Understood. 8 million people It didn't get a single Democratic border. vote, though, Mr. Chairman. Will it be attached to this package again for another look? We'll have to see what the final package is that comes off the House floor Saturday. But currently, it is not expected to be attached to the Ukrainian funding, the Israeli funding, and the other and uh, the funding for Southeast Asia. But this bill is sitting over in the Senate, and it is a bill that needs to pass. Overwhelmingly, the American public are just disgusted and and just shocked that the administration is not doing anything to uh, to protect what is the the environment, the threat environment that we have in the country as a result of these eight million people who walked across the border. The FBI director has repeatedly said that we're at the highest threat level currently for a yeah. terrorist attack in this country as a result of the open border. Uh, the Biden administration needs to take action, and certainly this House has with HR2, and uh, the Senate should take up that bill immediately. Well, Mr. Chairman, as you rightly point out, it's not just aid for uh, Israel and Ukraine and Taiwan that are included. There are other elements as well. But on the subject of Israel, of course, we are still waiting to see what the response from Israel might be to the Iranian attack over this past weekend, which, of course, the U.S., together with others like the U.K., uh, did intercept the vast majority uh, of what was sent Israel's way. Knowing that that attack largely was unsuccessful, what would be a proportionate response from Israel? Is it possible in your mind, sir, that Israel could go too far? Uh, we'll leave up to Israel what their response should be. But first off, let's put this in perspective. Uh, unfortunately, this administration believes that if you use missile defense to, to thwart an attack, that the attack didn't happen. The attack did happen. Uh, Iran attacked Israel directly from its soil um, with over 300 drones and missiles. Previously, though, Iran has been continuously attacking Israel uh, through Hamas, Hezbollah, and, of course, through the Houthis have been even attacking our commercial uh, shipping lanes. Uh, they train them, they, they equip and provide them weapons to these groups of terrorist organizations, of course, Hamas perpetrating the October 7th attack on Israel. So Iran already has been attacking Israel. This is the first time that it was direct. And, and certainly, I don't think mm -hmm. that just because missile defense is effective that uh, Iran or uh, the United States should look the other way. So if the attacker doesn't lay a glove on you, you still respond, is what you're saying, Mr. Chairman. But what is a proportionate response? What could Israel do here as a military answer that would not wear on the alliance that includes the U.K., France and others? This has been a very delicate matter, of course, domestically for President Biden. What's the right move? Well, I, you know, certainly they won't be sending 300 missiles and uh, and uh, kamikaze drones into Iran. Uh, so I, I think if you're asking for what is a proportionate issue, I think certainly Israel's not going to be responding at the same level that Iran did. Iran sent a lethal force uh, toward Israel, yeah. and it, just because they, we have invested with them, we've co-developed uh, their missile defense. And of course, we aided, as you rightly reported, Joe. You know, you, the UK was part of that um, umbrella uh, that gave missile mm -hmm. defense its ability to take down these missiles. But uh, but this was a serious uh, threat uh, and attack by Iran, and it should be be viewed as such. Sir, we'd like to turn back to just the f affairs in your chamber with our final minutes with you, knowing that the cost of bringing aid for Israel and Ukraine and everyone else to the floor may be ultimately the speaker's gavel. What is your degree of confidence that Mike Johnson, having said today that he will not change the rules that allows any one member to bring forward a motion to vacate, is going to be able to make it out the other side of this? Is it a mistake for him not to change those rules? Would, would that be a better decision? Now, Speaker Johnson is being incredibly courageous, and you've heard him, and as you were reporting, he is saying he's doing the right thing, and uh, certainly he should be rewarded for doing the right thing. Bringing this bill uh, to the to the floor so that we can pass this on to the Senate and uh, send it to the president's desk is essential for our national security. And uh, I, I certainly, you know, I think, uh, overwhelmingly, uh, the, the membership of, of Congress is thankful that he's doing so. Now, I don't think that the small band of the Chaos Caucus, uh, those who want to remove uh, Johnson, 
uh, have the votes on the Democrat side to be able to remove him. You have to remember that the small group that removed uh, Kevin McCarthy could only do so with the support of the Democrats on the floor. And I think this time that if they go to the floor, they're going to stand alone. Uh, they'll be a very small minority. They'll be exposed for being a very small minority, and they will be unsuccessful. All right, Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for joining us Thanks this evening. Me. That's House Intelligence Committee Chairman Mike Turner of Ohio. We appreciate your time, sir. Now coming up, President Biden hitting the campaign trail in Pennsylvania and clinching some new endorsements there. We'll take a look at what's at stake in that critical battleground state next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Poised to be able to get this aid to them immediately. So, if um, this package passes, and I think it will overwhelmingly this Saturday, uh, the uh the United States is poised to make certain uh, that the ammunition is in the hands of the Ukrainians and that they're able to take it directly to the fight with Russia. We just heard moments ago from that individual House Intelligence Committee Chair Mike Turner of Ohio. For more on the status of that supplemental aid package in the House, we bring in now Bloomberg's Dan Flatley, who covers national security for us. So, Dan, he sounded very optimistic about the prospect that not only is this going to uh, help the Ukrainians right away if it passes, but that indeed it will pass, potentially by a massive bipartisan margin. Are there hiccups, though, that we should be watching for in the next 48 hours ahead of this vote on sure. Saturday? I mean, it's Congress. Anything can happen. But, you know, I was really struck by uh, Congressman Turner's comments about the fact that if there is a effort to oust Speaker Johnson, that the Democrats would prevent that. And so you, you almost it's a sort of an extraordinary moment where um, you have the more extreme members of, of either party and the centrists kind of coming together to pass this package and to protect Johnson from any re repercussions that may, might come from that. And it's, you know, it's, that's, that's unusual. I, I can't think of another time when that has really happened before where that's been the scenario. So, you know, I think that's going to be really interesting. Of course, anything could happen with these, with these aid uh, bills. You know, there's one for Ukraine. There's one for uh, Israel. There's, there's one for the Indo-Pacific, Taiwan especially. Yeah. Um, there's some other, there's a grab bag of other things with TikTok certainly being, mm -hmm. being one of those things. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot there, but assuming that everything goes smoothly and that it gets the support that the congressman predicts, the real question is going to be what happens to, to Johnson. Right. And if the Democrats and the Republicans can come together to sort of keep that, keep him in power, that will be a really interesting moment for Congress. Well, you said something interesting there. It depends what happens to these bills because they could uh, be reshaped somewhat through the process here, I guess, unless they just throw the rules out the window. And that's possible as well, Dan. But we're seeing an attempt to amend uh, this legislation already. Marjorie Taylor Greene has an amendment, for instance, that would uh, require anyone who votes for the bill, any lawmaker who votes for the bill, to conscript in the Ukrainian military. I'm assuming that probably won't be heard. But there are going to be some amendments debated. Could these change shape between now and Saturday? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are always attempts by clever lawmakers to sort of put people on the spot by using these measures, right? So assuming that everything gets through the House, though, the question then becomes, obviously, what happens in the Senate? And if the bills are changed at all in the House, that m makes it all the more uh, difficult to get through the Senate. Mm -hmm. And we know from our reporting that the Biden administration is already getting together this package of military aid to Ukraine together as we mm -hmm. speak. So, and, and Kaylee, you mentioned that there's no time to, to lose for the Ukrainians. So, you know, this is a delay, or any delay in this could not just be a parliamentary or procedural delay, but uh, have consequences on the battlefield as well. Mm -hmm. right, Dan, thank you. Great reporting. Dan Flatley starting us off here in our panel. President Biden called it an incredible honor today as he received endorsements from more than a dozen members of the Kennedy family, undercutting the presidential campaign, or so they hope, of independent Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Here are some of the comments from RFK Jr.'s sister, Carrie Kennedy. Daddy stood for equal justice, for human rights, and freedom from want and fear, just as President Biden does today. Bloomberg's Michelle Jamrisco joins us now. It's his third day in Pennsylvania. This one is special, flanked by a, a great number of Kennedys today, with the exception of one. Does that... Yeah make us think that the campaign is growing more concerned 
uh, about confusion over the Kennedy name. We all remember that ad in the Super Bowl. People think Kennedy, that's a Democrat, yeah. and that could take votes away from Joe Biden. I don't know how much there is the level of concern. There's certainly uncertainty about what uh, role the, the the other RFK might play yeah. in all this as spoiler. I think I think what the campaign was trying to do here was manyfold. I mean, this is obviously personal for Biden. He talks a lot about RFK being one of his political idols, brought him into public service to have the Kennedy clan there backing him, telling him that he has the family's endorsement and almost all of the grandchildren were endorsing him. That was really special for him. You could see he was glowing from that and really taking in all the praise around how he looked like RFK. Uh, he looked like daddy, as Carrie would yeah, say. Yeah. Um, so that was really special. But of course, importantly, she did kind of have some veiled criticisms uh, of her brother through the criticisms of Trump, talking about conspiracy theories, talking about how most people in the family are, are for Biden and, uh, you know, not directly hitting her brother, but really kind of pointing out, as she said, that no, there are only two people that have a chance at winning this presidency. So really trying to make that case. And on the on the side, also making the case that the, the, the campaign has tried to make for a long time, which is that this is democracy at stake, that they really need to push this hard. Yep. The choice is between, you know, democracy or, or chaos with, with Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Well, Donald Trump spent his day today in a courtroom in New York. He just actually finished emerging from the courtroom in which he reiterated some things we've heard before that he's supposed to be in Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, a lot of different places campaigning. But I'm here all day on a trial that is really very an unfair trial, according to the quote uh, that we've gotten from him. It is keeping him off the campaign trail. And notably, Biden on the campaign trail isn't calling that much attention to this court case. And I'm assuming, Michelle, that that is by design. Yeah, I think he doesn't really have to at this point. I think, you know, they're very careful in the Biden administration and the campaign to not go too hard on the legal proceedings there. I think they, they're happy to let those kind of play out on them on their own. But uh, Biden was, you know, kind of notably talking about how where Trump wasn't. I mean, he said... <laughs> Trump doesn't have a, a campaign office in Pennsylvania. He's there, you know, two, three days this week and, and talking about uh, a range of different issues and trying to take advantage of his presence and Donald Trump's notable absence there. Does this uh, economic populist message yesterday, increase, increase tariffs on China, uh, ring true for working class voters in a place like Pennsylvania? That seems to be Trump's lane. I think he, he played to the right crowd. I mean, they're, they're both trying to outcompete each other on being aggressive on China. It's, uh, it remains a bit of a mystery on, on how that's going to play out and, and on what level and how that comes to, to policy measures. But sure. we did hear Biden promise that the, the nip on steel deal is dead. So we'll see where that goes from here. Mm -hmm. All right, Bloomberg's Michelle Jamrisco, thank you so much for joining us. Now, still ahead, the IMF spring meetings are well underway here in Washington, and the IMF's managing director, Kristalina Gorgeva, sat down with Bloomberg to discuss the outlook for the global economy. We'll have more on that conversation next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. IMF Managing Director Kristalina Gorgieva says she doesn't think investors should, quote, gear up for rapid declines in interest rates. She spoke on Bloomberg Television earlier today. The Fed is doing the right thing. They're watchful. Keep your eye on the ball. And at this point, the ball is bouncing up and down, and the Fed is not yet prepared, and rightly so, uh, to cut we still remain optimistic that within this year, conditions in the United States would allow the Fed to start cutting. For how fast, uh, I don't think that we should gear up for rapid decline in interest Can I jump rates. in and ask you what you think the source of that optimism is? What's behind that? What leads you to believe that those interest rate cuts are coming? Well, what, what we're seeing is um, the uh, economy is indeed slightly overheated, but part of it comes from the uh, fiscal stance of the United States. Uh, so there is room to cool a bit the economy just by being more watchful, and it would help the United States overall because, uh, as we know, deficit uh, has gone up to 7%. The second reason is that uh, 
so far, the uh, business environment in the United States has not reacted very firmly to the interest rates being high, but we see a little bit of softening underneath, especially uh, in SMEs. And that tells us that high interest rates ultimately bite. Can I tease that out just a little bit more? Are you effectively saying to us that the US exceptionalism that so many people are talking about is ultimately unsustainable? I didn't say that. I'm asking. Uh, I, I, would, I would tell you, where, what are the sources of this exceptionalism? And I think they're with us to stay. One is very deep capital markets. People are coming here not only because they can generate more income with high interest rates, they're coming here because the economy is very vibrant and capital markets are, are deep. Second, innovation in the United States move very quickly from idea to a venture and then to scaling up. And three, the US is tapping into a very vibrant labor force right next door. What in the eyes of many people is a problem, and I, ad I admit there are elements of this uh, uh, flow of people that is concerning, is actually feeding into the labor market of the United States in a way that keeps wages lower than in some other uh, countries and keeps uh, the ability of businesses to grow basically unlimited. A conversation with IMF Managing Director Kristalina Gorgieva speaking earlier on Bloomberg surveillance. A fascinating conversation, uh, Kaylee Lyons. Has she not spoken with Joe Biden? I thought we were getting at least one interest rate cut this year, maybe delayed by a month. Remember, he actually was forecasting that during a campaign event. Yeah. And I'm still not sure where he got that view. Well, and he stood by it despite the hot inflation data that we saw for a third month That's right. in a row. He did suggest it could be delayed about a month, but he yeah. does think a cut will come sure. when, of course, this is also a White House that has said it, it prizes the independence of the Federal Reserve in a way that they say the prior administration did not. <laughs> right. yeah. Yet I guess when you're in an election cycle and you're not just an incumbent president, but also a presumptive Democratic nominee, perhaps that is something you need to weigh in on as voters consider Mortgage rates. Well, I guess that's and right. The cost of living. If you're pointing to hope to the for the future, I guess that right. would be part of it. And he is, of course, hoping uh, for a soft landing here that this will actually coincide with the time period that people start paying attention. That would be Labor Day to November. And you know the Fed has a reluctance to be moving rates right before an election. Well, so they say that September we cut might be that. hard or else they'd be seen as influencing potentially. Hopefully. Coming up as Congress tries to finalize long-awaited assistance for allies like Ukraine and Israel, we're going to take a deeper dive, take a look at the conflicts where the aid would be going with Evelyn Farkas next on Bloomberg TV and radio. The situation on the battlefield is now difficult. The Russians are pushing along the whole front line and there are, uh, they are launching um, waves of airstrikes against Ukrainian cities, infrastructure and against the Ukrainian uh, forces. At the same time, I see some important encouraging signs when it comes to uh, NATO allies stepping up support for Ukraine. And then uh, we now have uh, encouraging uh, uh, messages, signs uh, from the U.S. Uh, Congress that they will vote on a package of uh, 61 billion uh, U.S. dollars uh, for Ukraine in the coming days. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg earlier today referring to those encouraging signs here in Washington. We do expect voting on these spending bills by Saturday. We're joined now for more by Evelyn Farkas, Executive Director of the McCain Institute at Arizona State University, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. Evelyn, it's great to have you back. Uh, we've been talking about procedure for so much of this hour. We want to talk to you to get a better sense of where this money is going, how quickly it could be put in place. And we'll start with Ukraine because that is clearly the urgent need. Bloomberg uh, was reporting today that the U.S. is already preparing a first package. The Biden administration is, is preparing a military aid package that they could send the minute after he signs legislation, assuming that it does pass uh, the Congress this weekend. What will be in that package? What's the first shipment that goes out? 
Well, I, I don't know specifically what the first shipment would be, Joe, but Obviously, they need ammunition badly. They're outgunned 10 to 1 um, in all weapons categories. And so they need missiles. They need regular ammunition for their rifles. Um, they need, of course, then air defense. So any kind of um, weapon, any kind of ammunition we have that goes into the air defense systems, like the Patriot batteries, they need that badly. Um, they, frankly, need more Patriot batteries also, as you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. the, or, or actually the NATO Secretary General mentioned, the Ukrainian cities are being bombarded and they don't have air defenses. So people are dying. Um, so it's really the ammunition and the and the ammunition, the ammunition for offensive or shooting back, if you will, and for the missiles. Mm -hmm. um, but then they also need to defend the, the citizens. Well, Evelyn, we heard from the director of the CIA, Bill Burns, today, who had a pretty stark warning. On the one hand, he said if, if the aid package does not make it for Congress, he warned that there is a very real risk that the Ukrainians could lose on the battlefield by the end of this year. He said that if the assistance comes through, both practically and psychologically, Ukrainians are entirely capable of holding their own through 2024. But is this war likely to end when this year ends, or are we going to be having the exact same conversation in 2025 and potentially beyond? Are we just helping Ukraine stay where they are versus making actual advances that could bring us toward the end of this conflict? Yeah, Kelly, I think you're asking the most important question because, first of all, we have to provide this assistance. If we don't, then whether it's the end of the year or the end of the summer, you know, at some point the Russians are going to use the advantage they have in manpower and in and guns and ammunition, and they are going to take more territory. And all of that will impact Ukrainian morale. It will also mean that they have to dig in and defend themselves with less weaponry. So it's critical for the Ukrainians to have access to ongoing weapons. But as you, you know, as your question indicates, the kind of weapons they get, the number of the weapons, and then the restrictions we place on them for using those weapons are really where the rubber meets the road. The Ukrainians need to be able to get longer range missiles, the Attackum missiles, that can take out the Kerch Bridge and other strategic military targets that will weaken the Russians' ability to keep flowing the ammunition for the guns and the, and the oil for the tanks. And if they can really strategically have access to weapons that provide them with the ability to cripple the Russian logistics um, chain, then, then they really have a chance to cripple the Russian advance because we think there is, a, there is an offensive coming soon. Evelyn, I want to ask you about the conversations that we're hearing on the House floor. This, of course, has been a tortured debate for months and months, and there are a lot of members of the Republican conference who don't think we should be sending more money. There's a, a, not another dollar crowd uh, that you're all too familiar with. And there have been some concern among uh, the leadership that there's some misinformation that's been creeping into the debate. And I'll point you uh, to an interview that Marjorie Taylor Greene, the congresswoman who has invoked this motion to vacate, held with Steve Bannon, in which she called the Ukrainian conflict a war on Christianity. She said the Ukrainian government is attacking Christians, executing priests. Russia is not doing that. As a matter of fact, they seem to be protecting Christianity. Are you worried oh about God. Russian misinformation bleeding into the debate here in Washington? Is that already happening? I, well, that's false. I don't know where it came from, Joe, but clearly it's actually the other way around. In Russia, if you are a Jehovah's Witness, a Mormon, um, some kind of evangelical, not a Russian Orthodox um, person, you will actually be treated as if you are part of a cult and a dangerous cult, as if you're almost a terrorist. The, the, the Russians do not have freedom of religion in the Russian state. Um, yes, they tolerate um, some obviously Islam and um, and some other religion that they consider indigenous, if you will, to Russia. But they are not mm -hmm. tolerant of other religions. And um, I mean, all you have to do is ask those churches. And, and as for the Ukrainians, they're very tolerant. Um, they have their own Ukrainian Orthodox church. They have Christians in Ukraine who live, uh, Catholics rather, sorry, the Orthodox are Christians. Then there are the Catholics who live 
mostly in the Western parts. Um, I'm ethnic uh, Hungarian. Many of those people are Catholic. Mm -hmm. They're ethnic Hungarians in, in Ukraine. There are Jews living there. The president and the prime minister are Jewish. So um, it's a very tolerant country, actually, as far as religion is concerned. And it's not the same cannot be said of Russia. All right. Well, we appreciate the fact check. Evelyn, and of course, we could ask you much more about the conflict in Ukraine, but there also is a live conflict in the Middle East we'd like to get your take on as well. We spoke earlier today with the former commander of the U.S. Central Command, General Ken McKenzie, about Iran's attack and the position he thinks the country is in now as we consider Israel's potential response. Just take a listen to what the general said. Iran felt they were in a corner, they were on the, they were on the wrong side of this equation. And so what they try to do is take a page out of the Russian playbook, what we call escalate to de-escalate. Do something profoundly aggressive that makes your opponents rock back on their heels and realize that maybe the game is getting too rich for them. Here's the problem, though. Russia uses this because Russia has vast resources, including nuclear capabilities. Iran tried it, but their attempt was found to be hollow. It was unsuccessful. So Iran is in a markedly weaker strategic position today than they were last week. Evelyn, I'm not sure if you agree with that characterization that we're talking about, potentially a weakened Iran here. But if that is the case, if the enemy is weaker, what should Israel's response be calibrated to as it considers what to do here? Yeah, I, I, I find General McKenzie's comments really interesting. He was a colleague of mine, and um, he makes an important point. What he's saying there is that Iran showed the world, demonstrated that it's actually militarily weaker than it even realized it was, right? Um, uh, you know, presumably they didn't launch all those ballistic and cruise missiles and, and drones at Israel to have them all get intercepted. And so, um, and that was a lot of weaponry. I've seen him quoted elsewhere saying they may have kind of um, blown their wad, if you will. You know, they don't have much in reserve. So this big dramatic strike um, actually sets them back in terms of what they have. Politically, though, I don't know, you know, whether they look as weak as they do militarily when you look at the array of weaponry, um, because they did demonstrate that they're willing to take risk. Um, and frankly, they crossed a red line. So you know, the Israeli response, um, if it remains muted, uh, I think is probably wise. But um, but on the other hand, the world should be doing more to deter Iran from crossing that red line a second time, if you will. All right. Evelyn Farkas of the McCain Institute. Always great to have you here on Bloomberg. We appreciate your time. Now, coming up, we've discussed the geopolitics. Now we have to discuss the domestic politics around it, as House Speaker Mike Johnson is moving ahead with his foreign aid plan, despite what it could mean for his job. We'll have more next with our political panel on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. Speaker Johnson is being incredibly courageous, and you've heard him, and as you were reporting, he is saying he's doing the right thing, and uh, certainly he should be rewarded for doing the right thing. Bringing this bill uh, to the to the floor so that we can pass this on to the Senate and uh, send it to the president's desk is essential for our national security. That was Republican Congressman Mike Turner of Ohio, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, speaking with us earlier this hour about the political fate of House Speaker Mike Johnson. For more, we're joined by our political panel. Ashley Davis is the founding partner of West Front Strategies and a former White House official for George W. Bush. And Kevin Walling is vice president of HG Creative and a Democratic strategist. So thank you both for being here uh, on Bloomberg Balance of Power, television and radio this evening. Ashley, just to begin with you, as we consider... The, the position that the speaker is in right now. He said this afternoon, despite murmurs that perhaps would have suggested he would do so, he will not be attempting to change the rules around a motion to vacate, which maybe suggests he is going to allow this to happen. Yeah, and I think it's obviously a risk for him, but I think that the importance of the bills that he's getting ready to pass on Saturday afternoon to him is much more important to the country than any of these one or two members that are willing to vote him out. I do think that it was a really 
big mistake when McCarthy had to, was mm. former Speaker McCarthy had to put that um, in place in order to get the speakership because this is going to continue to happen. But I think that Speaker Johnson, I mean, listen, I'm really uh, proud of him, I and mean, that sounds a bad word, but he's just, he's just like taking it bull by the horns and passing this. <laughs> well, with that said, uh, it's still unclear if he's going to have to worry about keeping his job, and we've been talking to Democrats about this over the course of the week. Adam Smith is one of them. Kaylee, you asked the congressman. We should actually uh, let you hear what he said. Adam Smith of Washington, this is ranking member Armed Services, told us he would support Speaker Johnson if it does get to this point. Here's how he put it. I, for one, will not vote to remove uh, Speaker Johnson. And I know a number of other Democrats feel the same way that I do. There's kind of this coy little thing back and forth as to whether or not we say that publicly. I tend to be more blunt and straightforward than most members, so I'm not going to be coy about it. It doesn't serve the interests of Congress or the country to remove the Speaker at this point. And he's carried through with his pledge to not abandon Ukraine, to give us a vote on Ukraine. And as long as he's done that, I'm certainly not going to agree with Marjorie Taylor Greene about who the Speaker of the House should be. All right, Kevin. So how's this going to work? He didn't say he was actually going to vote for Mike Johnson for Speaker, but wouldn't vote against him. Is this going to be an attendance thing? Do you have Democrats actually exercising? It could very well be. And, and all indications are, you know, Hakeem Jeffries had our conference uh, yeah. breakfast uh, today, kind of talking through that, kind of holding our powder dry. I think letting this play out on the Republican side and letting those dynamics uh, be what they are. Uh, but I'm with Ashley on this. I'm actually proud of the speaker as well, speaking as a Democrat, that mm -hmm. he has made a commitment uh, to bringing these bills up uh, for a vote. You see Adam Smith, uh, one of the adults in the room, right, former chair of yep. the Armed Services Committee, yep. now the ranking member, knows what's at stake with Ukraine, with Taiwan, uh, with uh, Israel. Um, and I hope cooler heads will prevail and we can put down the radical elements on both sides of the aisle um, and get this done for the American people. And I think it's going to be a large bipartisan majority that passes these, this package uh, on Saturday. We've heard from others in the Republican conference who are not supportive of the idea of another motion to vacate, like Congressman French Hill of Arkansas, who was That's with right. us earlier this week, suggesting that the biggest problem with this is a political one, that if the Republicans want to keep hold of the House, they cannot do this. If Democrats don't allow this to happen a second time, does it reduce the odds of them being able to flip this thing come November? I don't think so. I think some folks have a long memory about the drama around uh, former Speaker McCarthy. But I think it's almost a pox on both houses when it comes to inaction from Congress. I don't think the American people realize necessarily that this is the smallest uh, majority that we've seen in, in generations. Uh, what they see is a dysfunctional Congress, and I think there's a fear that they will blame both parties uh, if we're not out there better on messaging. So I think if we go through another vote like this, a motion to vacate, there's more drama, nothing gets done. I also think it hurts the president, right, if we're unable to do the basic functions of government. I think, I think a lot of people don't make that connection, mm -hmm. and they probably blame Joe Biden, too, for inability to get things done. So whatever happened to the old what doesn't kill you makes you stronger? If, <laughs> if Mike Johnson survives this... Isn't he a made man, at least for now? I realize that things can change in November, but how many times does a politician have to go through that process before they've convinced everyone? Well, I think this is going to continue to happen to him until yeah. we change the rules. And if the House does stay Republican, I can't imagine that they won't change those rules in a new Congress. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just can't live or govern this way. It's just too hard. Well, how much governing do you think we'll really expect from this point on, assuming that this supplemental package hmm. does indeed get over the finish line, knowing that this was this difficult to accomplish and we're only going to get closer to the election, Ashley. Should we expect anything else? Well, we have a Capitol few bills, not much, but I do think we have a few bills. I mean, maybe you'll get something like the National Defense Authorization mm -hmm. Act before the election. But I mean, even now with my day job, I mean, we everyone's saying, oh, after the election, after the election, year end package for the majority. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's really shocking to me, actually, in the last 24 to 48 hours, is the TikTok bill. I mean, that so thing is going through, and it's go and I, there. I was at a Senate Republican thing event this morning, and there's no doubt it's going to. So go everyone through. who was upset about that and was going to kill the TikTok bill, and they're all going to hold their nose and vote for it now because it's attached to other stuff. Well, is that that's how we one. I mean, that's uh, as you both know how things will pass in the Senate. Mm -hmm. You kind of have to put it into bigger packages. Right. It's really hard to get a bill like that. But it had such strong support in the House. Mm -hmm. The Patty Murray, who's the chair of the Commerce Committee, yeah. her big issue, or one of them, was that it was supposed to be divested in 180 days. Right. Now that they extended that, that's right. 
And also the president came out against that. There's no one backing, not backing it's the incredible. bill. So, so it's, really I mean, I mean, you had a 50 to zero vote on right. the Energy and Commerce Committee, which is kind of unheard of, too, yeah. to, to Ashley's point. So that does potentially have legs. What are you going to do with your TikTok? I don't have a TikTok. You're not on TikTok? Joke. I'm one of those people that either. I just watched a video on Instagram no. about three days I, later. Yes. Okay, fine. Here's We're not that hip. No one here will be impacted. <laughs> I don't know if I have a second, but here's what I learned that's really interesting about this. Even if this is divested, the value of the company yeah. is really going to depend on the algorithm, which is what makes the company right. so... Which China's not going to give up. Correct. Correct. So yes. someone out, even all these investors that want to come together, that, that algorithm has it's to be developed. special sauce. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so it could Just be worth, like, nothing. Don't tell my 17-year-old, I can't deal with that when I get home today. <laughs> Ashley and Kevin, stay with us. Coming up, updates from the jury selection, former President Trump's criminal trial in New York. They got 12. We'll take a closer look at what happens next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. A vote for Joe Biden is a vote for our democracy and our decency. It is a vote for what my father called in his own presidential announcement in 1968, our right to the moral leadership of this planet. It was Kerry Kennedy earlier today in Pennsylvania underscoring her family's commitment to back President Biden over her brother, Robert F. Kennedy's independent campaign for the White House. The Kennedys endorsing Joe Biden en masse today. And for more, we reassemble our political panel, Ashley Davis and Kevin Walling. Uh, Kevin, pretty remarkable optics there to see the Kennedys rallying behind the president, the former congressman, uh, Joe Kennedy III, introduced him later at, a, uh, at an organizing event here. Uh, to what extent is the Biden administration worried about branding? To have the Kennedys come out like that to draw a line and say, we're not with RFK. Yeah. Here. Well, certainly you're seeing the, the, the reelect campaign focus on this issue. I was at the St. Patrick's Day event at the White House. I think yeah. there was like a thousand Kennedys there, were. there all the great grandkids and stuff that like that. That was quite a photograph as well. So, yeah, and, and, and exactly right, in the Rose Garden. So clearly this is a focus uh, not just of the reelect, uh, of the DNC. Uh, you have serious communicators uh, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of Liz and Matt leading that effort uh, to call out uh, the policy positions, really, of RFK Jr. And the fact that you saw those five siblings on that stage. You know, yeah. the, the president is really close, not just to, to the Kennedy family, but, you know, he is a bust of RFK <laughs> senior in the Oval Office, right? So to take on that Kennedy mantle, and that's what the siblings today are con conveying to the president because of what he's been able to do, what he stands for, and really calling out the conspiracies to some degree. You saw that in Kerry's speech uh, just earlier. Uh, the conspiracies uh, floated by RFK Jr., their, their own brother. Yeah. Well, I wonder to what extent you view, Ashley, how much Trump should also be worried about hmm. RFK Jr., considering while Biden was off point. with the Kennedys, Trump was in a courtroom in New York today. Hmm. Well, there's that whole thing, too, which, <laughs> which he is raising money from, I mean, because I do think there's a lot of our country that do, does not trust our legal system and that he's raising money off being a victim, hmm. right or wrong. Hmm. Um, so I'm not sure how much the, I think the longer that the trial lasts, the more, you know, it's like okay for a week, but if it's like two months and he's still Which doing the same well thing, maybe. yeah, exactly, <laughs> that's going to hurt him. But there's two things. I'm not convinced that RFK doesn't take Trump voters away either. I mean, I don't know if we really know. They have more like, overlap on the issues. Yeah, and he's like the libertarian message mm -hmm. a little bit, the anti-vaxxing message. Those are Trump voters. But then also the, 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 the scene today the voters that I think RFK, which is a lot of the young voters, does en do any of them, I'm asking you this question, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, do any of those voters care what the Kennedys well, and, and I think it's not just, says or whatever? I, I think I, it's, I'm not being... Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's just young voters. I, I think it's also 
black voters too, right? Yeah. There's an affinity towards the Kennedy legacy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's reports now that RFK Jr.'s campaign is now on the ballot in Michigan, mm -hmm. yeah. right? That's going to be critical. And, and every indication is he's going to be a spoiler, right? He's not going to be on every yes. uh, one of the 50 states. His vice presidential nominee is, you know, untested and is just funding the effort. Um, but I think there's real fear that he can make a difference in some of those key battlegrounds. You just broke she's the fourth wall between our panelists. That's never <laughs> happened on this program. Now she's, now she's taking over. Ashley's taking over. Thank you and congratulate you. This is honest conversation right here. You guys are amazing. Ashley Davis and Kevin Walling, a fascinating conversation here. Uh, in our remaining moment, uh, Kaylee, there's a lot to consider about the impact with the next six months or next six weeks, rather, this trial are going to have on the campaign. We could have Absolutely. a very different view of things by the time it's done. And it's worth pointing out, 12 jurors were selected yeah. today in that criminal trial in New York. They still need six alternates. We still have a long way to go. And, of course, we'll keep it covered on this program and in the Washington Edition newsletter on the terminal and online. Thanks for joining us on Balance of Power. We'll meet you back here tomorrow on Bloomberg TV and radio.